uh, while we're doing this. And there's one additional challenge that I have, uh, because when I'm by myself, I wear hearing aids. And when nobody makes sound, I don't recognize that I don't have my hearing aids in. So this morning, I'm, I'm completely without hearing aids. So uh, Ann is going to have to interpret remarks to make sure that I can hear uh, what we're talking about. Uh, competencies is an interesting word. Uh, I think it's something that we talk about, but without thinking about it a great deal. But with a lot of the things that's happening now, um, I think we really have to pay a lot more serious attention to competencies. And part of that is a result of the fact that health and health care are undergoing major changes. What we've done for so many years of my life no longer uh, is what we do. Things are changing constantly and it's having a big, big impact on all of uh, parts of the system itself. Technology itself is advancing at an incredible rate. Uh, in my early career, uh, we would talk about 10-year planning ahead, and, and over the next 10 years, we decide what we're going to do. Now we talk about six months planning ahead. Technology is changing at that speed, and as a consequence of that, it makes a huge difference in terms of not only the competencies we have, but the fact that there's a lot of new things uh, that we have to learn about as we react to the technological advances itself. The community of interested parties is increasing. The lovely part of my early career is nobody knew I existed. Uh, we had our own little group. We did what we wanted to do, and nobody else was, was aware of what we were doing. Now that's changed totally. Informatics and all the consequences of informatics uh, are very visible at all level, particularly governments, and the composition of this conference is a good indication of the mixture of people that are coming from around the world and the mixture of professionals that are here dealing with some of the uh, competencies, some of the changes that we're talking about. So the roles of the participants are changing as well. Thank you very much. Uh, and we have a lot of new tools that require understanding. And so some of the new initiatives that we're talking about, one is in my early years, uh, the patient was almost uh, quite, never talked, never asked an opinion. They were very passive in the process of healthcare. Uh, now that's changed a great deal. Uh, the patients come into the professionals knowing almost as much about their disease and their problem as the professionals dealing with them. So it's a totally different world, and dealing with that population requires some significant uh, new competencies of being able to understand the things that's happening. I think the biggest indication of what I'm talking about is watching uh, television and looking at all of the drug ads that are on TV, the, the uh, pharmaceuticals that are telling you what drugs uh, to take, and in turn, if they do a good job of selling it to you, you go tell your doctor what drugs you want. So it's a totally different, it's a changing world of, of what we're talking about. Predictive analysis. Uh, we might have used the word analysis, but it didn't have the same meaning now. Now it's a very significant component of what we're doing, again, involving some new competencies of being able to understand the data and what the data is saying to us. The most exciting thing uh, that, I can, that I can talk about now is Watson and what's called cognitive computing. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But all of a sudden, we're overpowered. The humans are overpowered with all the data that we have, uh, much more than we can use to make decisions. And as a consequence of that, uh, we need the computers to help. And the computers are getting smarter than we are. They're able to deal with more facts uh, than a human is able to do. And over the next few years, and it might be as, as few as three to five years, we're going to see the role of computers significantly increase. And again, these are going to require some new competencies uh, in dealing with this. Watson, a uh, very famous IBM uh, computer that, uh, that, that was able to beat two humans in jeopardy, uh, is now impressing everybody with some of the uh, 
decisions that are being made by the computer itself by looking at basically all of the available literature in the world uh, and, and making decisions based on both the, the, uh, the data that is able to access as well as using the knowledge that it's able to talk about. And we'll talk a little bit about more some of those changes. There are new business models and new methods of reimbursement. Over the years, reimbursement has had more of an impact on what we did with health IT than anything else. That probably is going to continue, but I'm hoping that someday we'll begin to worry about outcomes, about patients' uh, improvement as a consequence of healthcare rather than what it costs to do all of that too. And then there are new forms of data collection. And I think, again, this is something, uh, wearable devices and mobile devices. So what we're doing is creating data at an astronomical rate much beyond the ability of a human, which can deal with maybe five to seven different pieces of data at one time for making a decisions, the thousands of pieces of data that will be used as part of the decision-making process. All right, so if we can move ahead. Uh, so some of the new initiatives that I'm talking about that will require new competencies, first of all, there are new data types. Uh, the data will, will look at some of these new data types and recognizing what new things that we have to do. But these are some of the initiatives that are happening in the United States. Precision medicine is an initiative uh, introduced by President Obama uh, last year and uh, is beginning to get funding from the U.S. government uh, and is beginning to pick up a great deal of momentum in terms of the research that's happening, in terms of understanding what precision medicine is all about. And again, there are new competencies that have to happen uh, as we uh, are dealing with, with precision medicine. Population health. Uh, instead of worrying about an individual now, we're worrying about populations. It's, it's a response to the fact that the minorities have the poorest health of anybody. Uh, if you live uh, in a very poor area, you're apt to have more health problems than if you live in a, a, a more well-to-do area. So there's a consequence between your status in society, between your economic uh, value in society and health care. Population health is trying to bring equality uh, to that process. And there are a lot of new things and new competencies that are required to be able to do that. Big data for knowledge extraction. What we really are trying to do is to create uh, a data set that will have billions of people in it rather than hundreds of people in it or even less than that, which a lot of our clinical trials are using. We really are trying to pop. One of the things that precision medicine is trying to do uh, is to obtain a database of 100 million people that have consented to let their data be used for research. Uh, that's a significant increase uh, over the amount of data that we have available for research. But big data goes even beyond that level, and that's what we're talking about. Looking at people, looking at a great detail about people, and seeing what happens to them over a number of years. So we're looking at temporal courses of disease, temporal phenotypes, if you will, that predicts what is going to happen to uh, an individual that has a disease, and we can compare that individual with others and predict that they will behave the same way. So it'll have a significant impact on recognizing which particular path you are traveling. Uh, the cancer moonshot uh, is uh, beginning to get a lot of attention now. The way to get attention is to provide research funding. And the initiatives that I'm talking about are all extremely well funded. Uh, I think the Cancer Moonshot is a focus on cancer. We'll see a great deal of research and we will see significant outcomes, in my opinion, on people with that particular problem. And then finally, learning health systems that we still are trying to define what that means. But if somebody is doing something and doing it better than anybody else, then why wouldn't we recognize that, see what they're doing that we aren't doing, and start applying that for in, in our own systems? Again, there's a lot of, of, of problems associated with this, uh, and, and again, uh, it requires some new competencies of understanding how to change the culture of where we accept an idea from somebody else that's better than ours, and 
a culture that says if we learn something new, we are willing to share that with other people so they get better as well. That's what learning health is all about. But you can recognize the fact it is a political situation. It has impact on economics and finances and things of that nature itself. So I like this slide. I found this recently, uh, and it talks about the most disruptive terminolo uh, technologies. And the first one is mobile technologies and application. And the theme of this conference, I guess, is M Health, mobile health, and this is one of the factors. What's happening now, first of all, mobile health brings together a lot of people that otherwise were not connected to the system. But it puts me in command of everything that happens to me. So my mobile health is my connectivity to me, myself, my health, my body, my, my data, and I can control how it flows for me and to whom it flows. So we're looking at, at major changes in the healthcare system as a result of that. Big data and analytics, I've already talked about some of the things that we come from that. Advanced robotics, I'll talk a little bit about, more about robotics uh, in a few minutes. But again, what when I was a kid was science fiction, but now is becoming reality. And I think that's one of the changes and what that means to us, I think is particularly uh, significant. The Internet of Things, uh, again, is having a huge impact on, on the healthcare systems. And some of the other things here that don't apply directly to the health, but, but, but apply indirectly. So there was a report coming out of the Institute of Medicine recently, and what this report said is that clinical data, the yellow, represents only 10% of data that has significance in understanding the health index of an individual. And the health index effectively is the quality of life based on, on health uh, and, and the problems that, that you have, but only 10%. But all of my career up until recently was focused on clinical data. Now I'm having to change my perspective with new competencies that are doing. The large uh, blue area itself, the 40% is on behavior. And again, the challenges of dealing with behavior, how do you convince people to exercise? How do you convince people to exercise properly? How do you convince people to pay attention to their weight? All of those are factors that require competences in being able to influence. How do you convince people to not smoke? So a lot of the things that I grew up with that was assumed to be okay and commonplace were having to change. And behavior has more to do with our health than anything else. The uh, orange is genomics. Uh, the uh, purple uh, is, uh, is social and economic uh, and, and environmental uh, is the green. So all of these are things now that's new data, new kinds of data that we're dealing with. And again, if I'm looking at environmental data, I need to know what, not only how to collect that data, but what to do as the result. For example, if you live within a mile or a mile and a half of an interstate, then you have a higher risk factor for respiratory disease than if you live further away. So, what are you going to do about it? You're not going to move the interstates. Uh, you're not going to move the housing development. So, so you learn something, but, but what are you going to do about it? And my and the immediate response to that is, well, I will try to keep future housing developments not to be built within a mile and a half of an interstate. But those are some of the challenges that we dealt with. And how you talk to the people that control where those houses are built is another significant problem that requires that sort of attention itself. So new data in population health, there's new partnerships that you have to measure. So you have to deal with government at all levels. In the US, the labels that we put on those are city governments, county governments, state governments, regional governments, and national governments. And now we are dealing with the global enterprise itself because of the mobility. And if you look at the rapid spread of the epidemics, uh, Ebola for one of those, Zika virus is another one of those. It's happening very, very frequently with increasing speed because of the mobility of people. And again, new competencies and able to understand what's happening and how to do, do with that. We have to deal across technical and culture uh, boundaries. 
Uh, Europe has some significant challenges, probably more than the states in the U.S., but I'm, there are times when I'm not convinced, even if we speak the same language uh, mostly uh, in, in, in the U.S., uh, but those problems in looking at the conversation uh, we had last evening uh, of something like 70 different languages are spoken within the EU. These are all the different dialects and everything else. So what do you do about that? What is the level of communication? And how do you do with the culture of centuries? New competences are required for that too. So we need to understand some of the problems. Uh, I can make an entire speech and use nothing but acronyms. And sometimes I do. Uh, and I always get frustrated because if I have to tell you what the acronym stands for, I'm taking twice as much time to tell you something that if I never use the acronym. So I always tell my students, you don't care what the acronym stands for, just understand what the acronym is. But a lot of people who are listening to us for the first time are really frustrated that we speak in a foreign language that they don't understand. So part of the competencies I have to have is understand uh, how to talk to those people that we're talking about. We need patience and understanding uh, as we move ahead with what we're talking about. So competencies require understanding how to integrate different kinds of data. We now are beginning to collect a great deal of demographic data, and I've predicted that uh, much of the world uh, will begin increasingly to connect DNA data. Uh, at Duke University, where I'm from, we are collecting uh, DNA, DNA data on most of the newborns, and we're increasingly collecting DNA uh, on a number of, uh, of the patients. Many people are doing it on their own, but very, very quickly, and again, I think within three to five years, we probably are going to have massive DNA databases. And what we used to call junk DNA, we no longer are applying the label junk. What we're doing is understanding there is a significance, it, there is an impact of genetic data on health and health care and health risk, but that alone is not sufficient. So you can have two, two twins with the same DNA structure. One will get a disease and one won't. So why? It's a consequence of environment, of social, of economic, and, and learning how to build that into the healthcare data that we're talking about. What are the risk factors? We, are, we have a number of algorithms that calculate risk. And the first thing I do is to ask, so what do you do about it? I know your risk is high for this particular disease, but unless you have some intervention, some way that you can reduce the risk, take advantage of that, then it doesn't serve any purpose. And so one of the challenges that we have is understand how to act upon the consequences of some of the things that we found. We need to identify the right problems so that we can find the right value and the right solutions. And again, most of us are biased by what we think is possible, and we're biased by the present, and we're biased by the rules that we think are in place, and we don't have the ability of changing that. The new competencies that we require is the ability to interact with the people that made those rules that need to be changed. So if the law says you can't, but you understand that you need to make the change to better the health of the population, then your first job is to change the law. And that means we have to know who to talk to and how to engage in a process that will cause those laws to be changed for the better. Many of the things, the laws that we have and, and other rules that we have came from a century ago. And, and the assumption is it, won't, it can't be changed. That's the change that we have to make in our competencies of understanding. That's our responsibility and that's what we really need to be doing. We have to have new methods of, a dealing, of dealing with big data. I have the, the, I think the good fortune of starting with little data uh, my first electronic health record uh, was built in 1970, uh, and it was built on a machine that had 4K bytes of main memory and 3,000 K bytes of external storage. And you get to be a pretty uh, competent programmer to be able to deal with that. You, you spend days on a single line of code because of the consequences of that. Now. 
the numbers are overwhelmingly higher than that and learning what the impact of that. But we, we are engaging a bigger population, so we need new competencies in handling such huge volumes of data and such huge numbers of people. And so there are new software that are available, such as Hadoop, uh, and MongoDB and other things are coming out now that lets us do parallel processing. But all of these are the things that are happening uh, that require competencies of understanding and understanding how to use that to accomplish what we're going. One of the problems that we're having at Duke now are trying to introduce uh, HL7's new fire standard and, and looking at trigger events. We want, we want the data itself to tell us when something needs to be done. But that means every piece of data that gets created and put into the system, I do something different. So every time there's a new input of, of, of a, a bolus of data, I want to recalculate the health index of the patient. So it's a human, I always say, the worst personal doctor you can have is the one who knows you best. Because they remember you, they remember what problems you're having, and it's hard for them to discover anything that's new that's happening to you. But we can take that bias out with a computer, and we can, every time there's a new influx of data, we can reevaluate the status of an individual from the very beginning of time. Those are the kinds of consequences uh, that technology is providing for us today. And then cloud computing basically means I can have access to knowledge, I can access the data anywhere in the world that we're talking about. So one of the more difficult things that I've had in my career is learning how to talk to the clinical professionals. Uh, they have zero interest for the most part uh, in the acronyms that we're talking about, in the technologies that we're talking about, uh, and we need to engage them. We need the competencies of talking to them to get their attention, to get their understanding, and to be able to understand what they're saying, what they do, and why they do it. And that's, that's the challenge, I think, that we're facing right now. So trying to figure out a way to keep the doctors and the nurses from turning off the minute we have a conversation with them. So what technique, one of the things that I've been trying to do with this is I take a big piece of white paper, and then I say, okay, tell me what you do. And let's take, for example, looking at tuberculosis. And so, you know, the answer to my question is, what do you do when you're worried about this? And the first thing is, well, we have a series of tests that we do. But I say, you don't do that to me when I come into your clinic. And so when do you, who do you do the tests on? Who do you suspect? What is the index? And so you're able to find out whether well, certain circumstances, if you're in prison, if you're a healthcare worker, there are things that increase your risk factor, and that's one of the behaviors that we do uh, to the risk that we're talking about. And so as a consequence of that, um, we're able to uh, move ahead with, uh, with some of the things we're talking about. I'm looking at time and I've got to worry about, uh, about all of that too. But one of the ways of doing this is simply draw a picture of what's happening and, and then requiring them to tell you where decisions are and where you're coming from. So data sharing uh, is uh, a very challenging initiative that requires a great deal because most people think data has value and it does. And why would I share that information? Why would I share that data that's proprietary to me? Why would I let another institution have it or put it in a database somewhere of what we're talking about? So we're gonna put all this together. Everything today is a source of data and it's just coming at us with hues. So it's a commodity, uh, needs to be pulled from the source, it needs to be used where it's, 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 it's useful. Uh, just a couple of quick slides and getting to the end. Uh, one of these, the, the slide on the left, is a, an app that is used to discover autism. The, the child is looking at a video and, and the computer is mapping out the facial expressions of this individual and interpreting the consequences of that uh, in terms of autism. And the one on, on the right is some other uh, things that we're happy about. Social networks, a huge source of data. Geospatial systems, very important. Wearables are very important. Natural language process, machine learning, neural networks, data visualizations or competencies. Uh, predictive analytics, uh, important. Cognitive computer with Watson. Uh, artificial intelligence, uh, robotics. I, this is fascinating to me. Uh, 
I had difficulty with a, with a slide with a picture on the my right uh, because I thought that was a human and I couldn't figure out where the robot was was coming into play. That is a robot that has skin that feels like human skin. The Japanese have made fantastic progress uh, in doing all of that. So future companies, technologies will grow, communities will change, policies will change, and new competencies will have to be done. Thank, Thank you. you.